Um, hello and welcome to the second webinar of our new series. My name is Katie and I will be the host and moderator on behalf of the Wildflower Society of Western Australia. Before we begin, we would like to pay our respects to and acknowledge the traditional custodians where we are hosting and recording this webinar, the Woodjuk people of the Noongar Nation, as well as the traditional custodians of the various lands which everyone joins us from. Today's presentation will go around will go for around 45 minutes. We will follow with some Q&A afterwards. So please make sure you hold any questions for the end and where you can send them in the chat box or if you would prefer to ask yourself, just raise your hand in the toolbar and we can unmute your microphone. Um, and if anyone does run into any issues or difficulties and would like a hand, please contact the email address listed on the event's website and hopefully we can get it sorted. We are lucky enough to be joined for a second time by Emeritus Professor Hans Lambers from the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Western Australia. For this webinar, Hans will be presenting about Yule Brook and the Greater Street Brixton Wetlands, also known as a jewel in the crown, a recognised global biodiversity hotspot. The Greater Brixton Street wetlands are notorious for their enormous plant species richness and home to numerous plant species that have con special conservation value, as well as several threatened ecological communities. But unfortunately, major threats such as climate change and the continuing development of Perth using outdated principles which ignore the region's sensitive hydrology will cause many threatened species and ecological communities to be pushed to extinction. Hans will discuss the great diversity of these wetlands, the threats and their impacts, as well as what we can what can be done to be, prevent at least some of the loss of this incredible incredible environment. I'll let everyone get to the good stuff now and I'll leave you in the very, very capable hands of Hans Lambers. Thank you, Katie. Well, as Katie said, I will be talking about Yule Brook and the Great the Brixton Street wetlands and that really is a jewel in the crown of a global biodiversity hotspot. And I'll illustrate it with facts in just a minute. Most of you will be familiar with the fact that Southwest Australia is one of several biodiversity hotspots. Originally, there were 25, now 35 are acknowledged. But it is important to point out that what actually is a biodiversity hotspot well, the area must have lots of species, 1,500 at least of the world's plant species as endemics, and it must have lost 70% or more of its primary vegetation. And you can see why WA, the southwest of WA, is a biodiversity hotspot, because you just have to drive through the wheat belt and you realize how much actually has been lost. And what I want to talk about is an area that is also under threat right on our doorsteps. And I need your help to make sure that it does get protected. Now, we're all familiar with three iconic national parks in the southwest of Australia, Lazua National Park, Stirling Range National Park, and Fergeddal River National Park. And there is indeed tremendous biodiversity. But it wasn't until Steve Hopper and Paul Goya actually explored this in greater detail that they also realized that Greater Perth is actually a particularly species-rich region. And in fact, it is fair to say that Perth is probably one of the most biodiverse cities in the world, and perhaps even the most biodiverse cities. Well, when I'm in Rio, I don't quite dare say that, but the difference is that we have the data as captured in this slide over here, and in Rio, well, they just have biodiversity, but they don't quite know but it is really as biodiverse as Perth is. Be it as it may, where exactly is that biodiversity in the Greater Perth region? Well, here you've got your three national parks I already mentioned, and here we've got Greater Perth. And Greater Perth is a vast area, of course, uh, actually pretty similar to something like Fitzgerald River National Park. But if you look at the number of threatened species and priority species, it's really up there compared with those three iconic parks I mentioned. And where exactly is that biodiversity in Greater Perth? Well, it is in the Yulebrook region, because you see, although it's only two, only about 1% of the area covered by Greater Perth, 
half of the species that occur in the Greater Perth region actually occur in the Yulebrook region. With 14 threatened species, plant species, and 6, 4, and 22 priority species, and 12 priority 4 species over there. So it really has tremendous conservation value. And I'd like to borrow a slide that Mark Prendretz produced some time ago, where he showed that the plant diversity here on the y-axis increases with the area over which you measure that biodiversity. Well, that's no big deal. You would expect that. But I'd like to single out first two areas here. That's Kings Park and Bold Park. They are roughly three or 400 hectares. And you've got to be, you've got there about 250 to 300 native plant species over there. But now let's go to the Great Vixen Street wetlands. It's only 100 hectares, but you've got well over 500 native species there, many of which are endemic. So really, it is incredibly biodiverse compared to Kings Park and Bold Park and any other region shown in this slide over here. And here are some of those species. None of them are rare. They're just very pretty, so I thought I'll expose you to them. And here are the figures for the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. We've got at least 558 native plant species, and many of them are priority species or threatened species. And there are as many as four threatened ecological communities. So it really captures the exact information that we have about the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. It is a jewel in the crown. And here are some of those declared rare flora species. And I want to zoom in later on Grevillea salamaniana, the spider net Grevillea. It's a super rare species that only occurs in the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. And my research with my team has actually discovered why this species is there and why it is rare. There's a couple of other species I'd love to find out more about. I'll get back to that at the end of my story because I don't know quite enough about it to tell the full story about. Here are some of those priority species. Some of them are coniferous. Plenty of orchids. I don't think there's any rare orchids there, but there's definitely plenty of orchids and a lot of them are in flower right now. And very interestingly, we've got more carnivorous plant species in the Greater Brixton Street wetlands than we can find in the whole of Europe. Absolutely astounding. And the reason for that is that we've got such incredibly nutrient-poor soils. So these plants pull out all the stops. And one of the ways to get nutrients, if you can't get them out of the soil, is to basically invite your prey for lunch or dinner. And that's how you get your food over there. A couple of utical areas over here, so blatherworts, they have little suction traps below ground and they suck in their prey. Well, we are doing some work together with a Polish group and they've looked inside what they actually trap. And they turn out, these carnivorous plants actually turn out to be either vegetarians or perhaps even vegans because there's very little animals that they actually capture and lots of material that they suck in like algae and, and bacteria and things like that. Very common, these carnivorous plants in the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. And some more species over here. Now the Belia group has actually proposed to work towards the regional park. So it is so incredibly precious to conserve that, I think that the Belia group is, is absolutely right. The name for that regional park is definitely not set in stone. I think an Aboriginal name might be much better. And But it would actually connect Les Murdy Falls in the northeast with the Canning River here in the southwest. So it would provide connectivity between the Darling Range and the river. And it would include the Yule Brook, and the Greater Brixton Street weapons. So that's the vision of the Bilia Group. And I'll get back to that later on, why that vision is so incredibly important. And to underpin that proposal, we actually decided to, 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 to bring all the information together that is needed to convince a minister or whoever to actually support the idea of a regional park. So that's the duel in the ground of a global biodiversity hotspot. I've tried to push 
the Wildflower Society to have it in stock, well, go there by all means and check whether they do have it in stock. If they don't, well, then you can always go to the website of the Western Australian Nation Naturalist Club and you can get it there. But the Wildflower Society definitely should have it in stock. So this is where the Brixton Street wetlands are. And I want to zoom in on Ellison Baird Reserve. That's a 30 hectare reserve acquired by UWA in 1949 for research and teaching purpose. And we do a lot of research and we take our students there for teaching purposes. So that's Ellison Baird Reserve over here. And you can see the Yuldbrook, this blue stream coming down from Les Murdy Falls. That's where it actually starts. And you can also see what is on this map called a drain. Well, that's a big mistake because if you go to old maps, you see not only Yuldbrook, but you can also see that that so-called drain is actually Crystal Brook, and Crystal Brook runs through Ellison Baird Reserve. And here you see it in winter. In summer, it's actually dry, but in winter, it's full of water. And at the edge of Crystal Brook, you see what the botanists for a very long time have called Muche limestone. Now, it isn't actually limestone, as I will point out later, but it is important to explain why we have a rare threatened ecological community there and some rare species over there. It is full of calcium, but that calcium is not just in this so-called limestone. It is also all, all under the uh, soil and in the, in the wetlands area of the reserve over here, east and west of a big Bessadine dune over there. And in Ellison Baird Reserve, although it's only 35 hectares, we have at least 480 native plant species with several priority species and six threatened plant species and three threatened ecological communities. And I'll show you the Banksy woodlands of the Swan Coastal Plain in a minute, the clay pens of the Swan Coastal Plain and the shrublands and woodlands on Muche limestone. But I hasten to add, there is no limestone there. But the threatened ecological community definitely exists over there. So that begs the question, why do we have this enormous biodiversity in the Greater Brixton Street wetlands, including Ellison Baird Reserve? Well, there are three main reasons. One of them is that we've got very, very crappy soils, severely phosphorus impoverished soils, really crappy soils. And as, as I showed in, in, in my next slide, the, the poorer our soils get, the richer our flora gets. Very intriguing question why that is but you've got to listen to my first webinar to actually find the answer to that. I won't go into that right now. I'll just make the point, poor soils are inhabited by a rich flora. And then we have a diversity of rather different habitats, including those three threatened ecological communities, for example. And we have that diversity of different habitats because the climate has been relatively stable. It has been geologically stable, no glaciations ever occurred there. Further inland, there were glaciations, but they were something like 250 million years ago. So they have no impact on all the diversity of the habitats that we have in Ellison Baird Reserve. And then we have a very special hydrology. The wetlands, they depend on groundwater and on subsurface flow. And if you don't acknowledge that, and if you think you can just destroy that, you will destroy the Greater Brick Street wetlands. I'll come back to that later in my talk. So here's my point that with decreasing soil phosphorus concentration on the x-axis over here, the plant species richness actually increases. So there's a dramatic increase with decreasing phosphorus concentrations in soils. Plants need phosphorus, certainly, but when there's very little phosphorus in soil, that is when we have the greatest biodiversity. And that is when we have all the proteacea. Proteacea don't really like the richer soils, but on the poor soils, that's where the Banksias, the Hakeas, the Grevilleas, and what have you actually thrive. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So here we have the Banksia woodland. So that's one of three threatened ecological communities. A great place to take the students and we even take our third year students there and they can spend a few days doing lovely research there and develop a wonderful story based on the research they can do there. We have the clay pens of the Swan Coastal Plain. 
another flattened ecological community. There's plenty of water that arrives there, but it's not surface flow. It's largely arriving there by subsurface flow. Very important. That is where we have heaps of carnivorous plants, such as Dros Drosra gigantea and also Biblis gigantea. But I must say, I haven't seen Biblis gigantea for many, many, many years. Maybe it's still in the seed bank, but I haven't seen it flower for a very, very long time. And that may well be because the hydrology there has already changed, partly because of climate change and also partly because the city of Gosnells has actually redirected the flow of Crystal Brook because somebody adjacent to Ellison Baird Reserve was complaining that his garden regularly got flooded. Well, if you build your house on a floodplain, what can you expect? But rather than deal with that, he wanted the Crystal Brook to be diverted. So less water actually flows into Ellison Baird Reserve and into the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. So that may well be the reason why Biblis Gigantica is actually suffering. And it is a priority three species. It actually may be upgraded to a higher priority very soon. And then we got the shrublands and woodlands on what we called Muche limestone of the Swan Coastal Plain. That's the third threatened ecological community. Now, the Muche limestone that you see over here, along Crystal Brooks, for example, um, that reveals a special ecological community. And that comprises this Dodonia over here and also this Gravilia over there. So it's a threatened ecological community and the Gravilia Silomaniana is a declared rare flora species. So I was intrigued to know why that species is there and why it is rare. And I'll tell you the, the story, which took actually several years to discover, but I can tell you that in a few minutes. Back to that water flow. So the Darling Scarp is to the far right over here. Water flows from the Darling Scarp, partly via streams such as Yule Brook and Crystal Brook, but also partly via subsurface flow. And all that water ends up in the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. If you stuff up the hydrology there, that's curtains for the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. So it's incredibly important to maintain the hydrology. If you stuff that up, then it's the end of the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. And as I said, that is where most of the biodiversity in the Greater Perth region actually is. So it deserves to be protected. Wetlands, they are very different from ponds or lakes. They are fed by rainwater and surface flow. But the wetlands in Perth, and that is no different from the Greater Brixton Street wetlands, they crucially depend on groundwater and also on subsurface flow that comes from the Darling Scarp. And that also brings the minerals that arrive with that water. And those minerals, they turn out to be very important to explain why we have some of the rare species over there. So there's your Muche limestone again. It actually turns out to be silkrete, but it is important to point out that it is very rich in calcium. And that is crucially important for a number of species that actually are part of the Muche limestone community. I'll zoom in on Gravillia stellamaniana, the spider net Gravillia. And I'm comparing the phosphorus concentration, the Gravillia, the green bars over here, with some of the other Proteacea in that reserve. Now, the other Proteacea are all Banksia species, and they have typically a phosphorus concentration between 0.2 and 0.3 milligram per gram. Extremely low, but they're very happy with those low concentrations. That doesn't affect their growth rate at all. That doesn't affect their rate of photosynthesis. That's a, photosynth that's a, a phosphorus concentration they're perfectly happy with. But you can see that the Gravillia, the Gravillia thalamaniana, has a phosphorus concentration that is about 50% higher. Now, that's actually rather interesting because Gravillias, they actually are very closely related to Hakeas. So here I'm listing all the Hakeas, and at the bottom here, I see the very closely related Gravillia. These species are so closely related that some people actually have proposed to merge the two genera but they didn't dare do that after what happened 
after the merger of Dryandra and Banksia, and they didn't dare risk another event that took place after Dryandra was sunk into Banksia. So for the time being, Grevillea and Hakia will be separate genera. But what is really interesting is that Grevilleas and Hakias, from a physiological perspective, are really different. And that's illustrated over here. So Hakias typically have a phosphorus concentration about 0.2 of a milligram per gram dry weight. And Grevilleas have a concentration that is about 50% higher. So what actually happens when that first Hakia emerged, or if you like, evolved out of Grevillea, it had discovered a trick to function at lower leaf phosphorus concentrations. So Hakias then could enter an environment that was not available for Grevilleas. Grevilleas, they need higher phosphorus concentrations. And Hakias, they can get away with even crappier soils than the Grevilleas can. So that is an interesting part of the evolution of Hakia out of Grevillea. So Grevilleas need more phosphorus. That's typical for all Grevilleas. And if you go to Ellison Baird Reserve, we can go to the sand dune in the middle of the reserve. We can go to the flats at the eastern side and at the western side of the reserve. And you can really see that the phosphorus concentration on the dune is very, very low throughout the profile. But if you go to the flats you, where Grevillea stellamaniana grows, you can see it is much higher. It's still nutrient poor, but it's much higher than on top of the dune. And that's true for the eastern side. It is also true for the western side over here. So Grevillea needs that extra phosphorus. And in the reserve, in Ellison Baird Reserve, you'll find that lower in the landscape. That's where all the phosphorus has actually been washed towards. It has been eroded from the top of the dune. It also may have come to some extent from the, from the Darling Scarp fire by the water delivered there uh, via Yulebrook. But that's where the extra phosphorus actually is. So, okay, it needs that extra phosphorus. But that's not typical for Grevillea thalmaniana. That's typical for all Grevilleas. What is typical for Grevillea thalmaniana and the group it belongs to is that it has very high calcium concentrations. You can see the calcium concentrations in the green bars over here between 30 and 40 milligram per gram dry weight much higher than any of the Banksias that you find in Ellison Baird Reserve. And I hasten to add, that's not typical for Grevillea because if you go to other, if you go to Grevillea Thalmaniana in different locations in Ellison Baird Reserve and also in the Bricks, in elsewhere in Brixton Street Redlands, you can see it always has between 30 and 40 milligram per gram. But if you go to other Grevilleas in the Brixton Street Redlands, You've got Grevillea bipinitifida, for example, and you can also find that in Les Murdy, that has much lower concentrations. And two other Grevillea species in Les Murdy also have much lower phosphorus concentrations. So that is typical for Grevillea stellamaniana and closely related species. They all have high calcium concentrations. And if you go to the soil, well, you can really see on the eastern flat, we have high calcium concentrations. On the western side, we have even higher calcium concentrations. That's closer to the uh, crystal brook that probably has delivered all the calcium there because the calcium in the origin of Yule Brook, close to Mooney Regional Park, the calcium concentration in the soil there are much higher, an order of magnitude higher at least than, the, than you will find in the rest of the southwest of Australia. But if you go to the sand dune, we see very low calcium concentrations. So the Grevillea is there because that's where we have those high soil calcium concentrations. Now, when plants accumulate a lot of calcium, they tend to accumulate, they tend to produce calcium crystals. We find that for rhubarb, for example, or, or spinach, or arum lilies. Arum lilies are loaded with crystals. And in Aram Lily's day, those calcium crystals are very sharp. That's why nobody, no animal wants to eat them because they actually damage their mouth part. So that's why Aram Lily's are such a pest. If kangaroos would be willing to eat them, well, then it would all be different, but kangaroos won't touch them because those crystals are so sharp. Now, as I said before, this 
Grevillea Savimaniana has very high calcium concentrations, but remarkably, we find almost no calcium crystals in these plants. When we go to these banksias, which function at much lower calcium concentrations, we see that they're loaded with crystals. In Banksia telemathesia, they are mainly at the upper side of the leaf, and you can see that here with greater magnification. And in Banksia menziesia and Banksia etidomata, they are mostly at the other side of the leaf. And all of this we've been able to do because we collaborate with Peter Claude at our Center for Microscopy. So she has the tools to actually measure all of this. So if the calcium is not in crystals in Grevillea thalamaniana, it must be soluble. That's interesting. But thanks to collaborating with Peter Claude, we can also make that visible. And she actually gave that a nice little color for you to be able to see where the calcium actually is. And you can see it is mainly at the outside in this cell layer over there. There's also some over here. And that is where the calcium actually is. Okay, so now we know the calcium is not in crystals. Now we know it is in a soluble form. But calcium, of course, is a positively charged ion. And you can't have a positive charge without that being balanced by a negative charge. So what is that negative charge? Well, here we needed a collaboration with a group that does metabolomics in, El in Melbourne, and they were able to actually tell us what the negative ion actually was. So you've got a whole range of ions, and what we can see over here is aconitate. Grevillea thelmaniana compared with Banksia um, thelmaciaea, which grows in the same area, has much higher uh, aconitate concentrations. Now, aconitate is a common compound that is also available in our body, and we need that for our respiration. But there's something special about aconitate because it occurs in two forms, a cis form and a trans form. And I'll explain that in a minute. But what is important over here, that in the Grevillea Salomoniana, there is not much of the cis form. And most of that, 98%, is actually available in the trans form. I'll show you the structure over, it, over in a minute, over here. So... You can see the cis form, which occurs in our body and in all animals and in all plants. And here's the transform. You can see this double bond has jumped from this location to that location over there. And it's very important to point out that this is the good guy. This is the guy that we need for respiration. And this is the imposter. This is the very, very, very bad guy. But because the bad guy looks very much like the cis guy, the, 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 the good guy, the trans guy is the bad guy, the cis guy is the, is the good guy, because they look very similar, the imposter stuffs things up in a big time. And that's what's actually shown in my next... Uh, slide bits I, I, I blocked over here. But important is if we go and see what cis aconitate actually does and look at these plant hoppers, these blonde plant hoppers over here, you can grow them on a sucrose solution. And if you add a little bit of cis aconitate, well, you can even add 0.5% of cis aconitate and the plant hoppers still will survive. At least 50% will survive. But if you give them trans aconitate, well, it's actually curtains for them. If you feed them on 0.5% of transaconitate, all of them will actually die. So it is a very toxic compound. So we know this nasty compound has a very nasty effect on plant hoppers, and it basically protects the grevillea against all sorts of herbivores, not just the plant hoppers, but a kangaroo would also not touch it because that compound is also not particularly healthy for the kangaroos. We looked at sodium because, as you know, sodium is a, is a big issue in, in large parts of the Southwest. And we measured the sodium concentration in the Grevillea. And you can see the Grevillea has much lower sodium concentrations than these Banksia species over there, whether they co-occurred with them or whether they occurred on the dune. 
So low sodium concentrations. So does that mean that somehow the Grevillea salamaniana has access to fresh water at depths? Or does it keep the sodium out? So again, we looked at the sodium concentration in the profile. The eastern flat, we find pretty high sodium concentration at the eastern side of the dune. At the western side of the dune, it's even more saline. On the sand dune, it's not so saline, but there's still salt there. That basically means that wherever that Grevillea thalamaniana grows, there is no fresh water. So if we don't find any sodium inside the Grevillea, it basically means that that Grevillea managed to keep the sodium out. And so we studied that a little bit more detail. And it turned out that this Grevillea is extremely sensitive to sodium. We gave it only 10 millimolar, which is something that wheat or barley or whatever don't worry about it at all. It's only avocados that are super sensitive to sodium that would get worried about 10 millimolar sodium chloride. But what you can really see if you measure the plant dry weight, it likes it when you give it no sodium. It doesn't like it when you give it five millimolar and it definitely doesn't like it when you give it 10 millimolar. But if you add calcium to the nutrient solution, then the plant dry weight actually is recovered. So the sodium has a negative impact, but that's sort of counteracted by the presence of, of calcium. And the bench tell us, yeah, we grew these from seeds rather than from cuttings, which we did for the Grevillea, so that's why they are smaller. But that species is not at all affected by salt. And if you look at the foliar sodium concentration, then you can see it's very low when you give it no sodium. It bumps up when you give it five or 10, millimolar, but if you add calcium, then that plant is actually able to keep much of the sodium actually out. So calcium is important to balance that 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 imposter, that transaconitate, which has a negative charge, but it is also important to keep the sodium out because the sodium concentrations in the reserve in Grevillea stelmanian are actually quite low, but there is no fresh water. So it doesn't access fresh water, so it must actually keep it out. So what is so typical about this rare spider net Grevillea? It needs calcium, but it doesn't occur in on calcareous soils where there's plenty of calcium. These soils are not calcareous. These soils are slightly acidic. And having calcium and a low pH, acidic soils is actually pretty rare. It needs the calcium to keep the sodium out, but most importantly, it needs calcium to balance the negative charge of that imposter, transaconitate, which is an anti herbivore compound, a feeding deterrent. So that's the story when it comes to the plant nutrition side of Grevillea salamaniana. But there's a bit more to it because it also grows in an area where water is available all the time. It is a wetland species after all. And we can study that by looking at the isotope composition of water. And we don't need to get into detail, but what you can really see is the deeper you go, the more negative values the, uh, 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 the oxygen isotopes in water actually have. And if you now measure the water in the stem of these species, you can actually work out where, the, where these plants get their water from. Now, at the far left, I've got Gavilia stalamaniana, and you've got a value of minus six there, which basically tells you it gets its water from a depth of about one meter, perhaps a little bit deeper in winter, but that's where it gets its water from. So not from meters deep, which is true for the Banksias over here. So if you go to the Banksias, we can see it ends up with a value of something like minus seven and a half. And that basically means it gets its water from something like five meters deep or so. So Grevillea thalamaniana does not have deep roots to access the water there. It has pretty shallow roots. That's where it gets the water from. But that will only work if there is a continuous supply of that water. It can't go deeper to pick up the water there like the banks just on top of the, of the dune actually do. These 
Carvilius and also the banksias that actually grow there, they pick up their water from fairly shallow la layers. And so there must be a continuous supply of water in those shallow layers. We also looked at how stressed these plants actually were. And that's pretty important. If I first go to the banksias on top of the dune, they are pretty unstressed all year round. Why is that? Because these banksias are smart. When they feel that they are running out of water, they stop their water loss. They close the, the little pores on their leaves that allow the water to be transpired. These guys prevent that water loss. If you go to the grevilleas and also the banksias that grow in the wet area, they become really stressed in summer. Not a problem. They keep sucking and sucking because they basically expect there will always be water. So they can afford to be a little bit stressed and suck the water out of the substrate over there. So they're not smart in the sense of curtailing their water loss. No, they will simply lose a lot of water and they basically expect there will be water all the time. So what makes this species then so rare and vulnerable? Well, it's wetland habitat with a high availability of water throughout the year is actually pretty rare in the Perth metropolitan area. It requires more phosphorus than is available in most habitats. And in the wetlands, that's available lower in the landscape because all the water of the phosphorus that used to be high up in the landscape has all been eroded <coughs> away down to the lower parts of the landscape. And it requires a very high availability of calcium and it mainly needs that to balance that imposter, the transaconitate, which is a feeding deterrent. And it's that, and of course, it also needs calcium to keep the sodium out. And it's that combination of the water, the, the need for continuous water all year round, the higher phosphorus availability and the higher calcium availability, it's that combination that actually makes that habitat is very rare. And because the habitat is rare, that species is rare. So that grevillea then requires abundant water. It doesn't like to be inundated, but it wants a continuous supply all year round. And so the hydrology of the region and the climate, they're crucially important. And a couple of years ago, I visited the reserve next to Ellison Bear Reserve. That's the one wing block. And you can really see that grevillea stellamaniana is not particularly happy there. And that is because that reserve doesn't get quite as much water as the Gavilia plants in Ellison Baird Reserve actually do. Why that is, whether the hydrology has changed or whether it's a matter of climate change, I can't actually tell you. All, all I can tell you, these plants are water stressed and they do need water all year round. And if that's not there, then they're under threat. It's probably a combination of a change in hydrology and climate change, but it's very hard to unravel which of the two is more important. And what about these other rare species in Ellison Bay Reserve? Well, we know far less about them, but we do know that this Andersonia gracilis that appears restricted to areas where the sand layer is very thin. And after that, it reaches loam. And loam contains far more water than the sands. And that loam is likely kept wet because of a continuous supply of water that comes from the Darling Scarp. And recently we, we discovered that the very rare Senefia species that we have over there is actually a, a, a selenium accumulator. And it is possible that that selenium only occurs in special parts of the reserve, probably delivered there by Crystal Brook. And that may very well be the reason why it is rare. But I'm only telling you this because we just discovered this, but it needs further work before I can actually wrap up the whole story over there. So I would like to emphasize that the hydrology of the region is very complex. A lot of the water does not flow via little brooks and streams. It occurs because it arrives there via subsurface flow. And a lot of development is actually going on, ignoring that complex hydrology. And that is a threat for our precious jewel in the crown, the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. And so that is the exact reason why the Bilia Group proposed this regional park connecting 
Les Murdy Falls was the Ganning River over there. Now, there is a consultant emerged. They have provided a report for the city of Gosnells. And honestly, this is the shonkiest report I've ever come across. They argue that having no buffers around the Greater Brixton Street wetlands is the best way to actually protect the wetlands. Well, if I say they argue, that's actually giving them too much credit because they dismiss the arguments of the EPA that have very good reasons to insist on those buffers. They dismiss those, those, those arguments and they're just pulling some figures out of thin air, present the table and then end up with the conclusion which make it's not underpinned by, by any science at all, but the end up is the conclusion that no buffers is the safest way to actually look after the wetlands. Well, the Bilia group says, no, you do need those buffers. And the best way to actually have those buffers is to make them part of a regional park. So what do you want? Well, do you want the industrial development or do you want the industrial development, but also allow a new Yulebrook Regional Park. Well, I invite you to have a look at this website over here. Visit that website and then you can quickly, quickly click on the link. And by doing that, you will send an email to several ministers, several, several relevant ministers. Um, and you can basically tell them by sending that email message that you actually support the idea of a Yulebrook Regional park, park rather than sacrificing that whole environment. So that's the website over there. Uh, you can also simply uh, Google the Bilia group and you will find the same information when you do that over there. So the Bilia group basically says, this is a vision which lets development and an expanded Yulebrook Regional Park exist side by side in a beneficial coexistence. My conclusions, the greater Brixton Street wetlands contribute immensely to the biodiversity of the Swan Coastal Plain. They are the main reason why Perth is one of the most biodiverse cities in the world. And the biodiversity in the wetlands crucially depends on groundwater, not surface flow, not the flow via Crystal Brook and Yule Brook. The subsurface flow is crucially important. And if you allow to development without buffer zones, giving that we live in a drying climate, well, that will be disastrous for many species in the greater Brixton Street wetlands. You will push them to extinction. And the local hydrology is very complex. It is poorly understood, but wetlands are not ponds or lakes. They depend on that hydrology. And the wetlands will be impacted negatively by climate change, and definitely by development without buffers. So the Bilia group proposed that regional park, and that would basically mean a reduction by only just 27% of the development plan produced by, in that Shonky report produced by eMERGE. And the question is, will the city of Gosnells be driven by greed or will they, Will the councils of the city of Cosnos be willing to act as custodians of a precious environment? So I recently raised this question at the council meeting of the city of Cosnos. Will you accept your responsibility as custodian of the Greater Brixton Street wetlands and ensure there will be appropriate buffer zones so the precious Greater Brixton Street wetlands will be protected and a regional park can come to fruition? What do you think the answer was? Well, I will share that with you. They basically say the WA state governments are the custodians and the WA state governments will probably tell that the federal governments are the custodians and they wash their hands. So it's the same old story as Pontius Pilate washing his hands. I think it is shameful that that is what the city of Gosnells actually provided as an answer. They are responsible for their environment. Of course they are. It is within their jurisdiction and so is the state government they are also responsible and so is the federal government if nobody feels responsible a lot of these rare species will definitely go to extinction and that is indeed why we produced this book it has all the information 
which tells you why that important uh, that that environment is so important and why we need to look after it. And let me finish with my acknowledgement because lots of people have actually contributed to bits and pieces that I have been talking about in this webinar today. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for that, Hans. That was very, very fascinating. I think things like this always remind me the more I know, truly the less I know. <laughs> um, we will, of course, have some Q&A now. So please make sure you send any questions you have in the chat box or feel free to raise your hand in the toolbar and ask yourself. Um, and any questions about the webinar are more than welcome. So please don't hesitate to send anything through, especially as we have one of the most knowledgeable people here to answer. Um, so yes, please send any of them through and we will get through all the questions. Alison said, thank you. That was very informative. Definitely, definitely was. Thank you, Alison. Hans, are there any other steps the public can take at the moment to support the Belia Group apart from writing um, and signing those letters to different members of parliament or particularly? I, I, think, uh, uh, I think contacting your local MP, for example, and contacting the relevant minister. And that would, I, I, I actually took Minister Rees, the Minister for the Environment, to Ellison Baird Reserve and that environment around it. I also took the chair of the EPA and staff of the EPA to Ellison Bay Reserve and the whole area around it. And I made the case that this is such a very precious environment. And they actually, they actually used the book to actually develop a case for protection. So I, th I think they, and I also talked to the WA Planning Commission. So if people want to sell their lands, it's their nest egg. They can sell their land, but they don't have to sell it to the developer. They can also send it to the WA Planning Commission. It's Their nest egg is not gone. They just sell it to a different institution. So they, they, they will not miss out. So Jackie said, wow, I have no questions yet, but that was fantastic and inspiring. Uh, and and said no questions from me but very interesting thank you and brett asked at, at this um, do all the clay pen systems like brixton street wetlands exist on the swan coastal plain um yeah they, they do it, it, it's not the only one uh, so adjacent to ellison baird reserve we have the wanaping block you will have clay pens there and then adjacent to that is brixton street wetlands you will have clay pens there there as well and there's probably some more areas, but they are, all of them are, are they're all rare, they're full of rare species, and, 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 and they're all threatened because of the development around it. So really, if you would affect that clay pen system over there, um, a lot of the species associated with that clay pen, I, I think actually would be pushed to extinction. And I should add that the Grevillea thalamaniana only occurs on these clay pens. And, and and nowhere else, only in the clay pens in the Greater Brixton Street wetlands. So there may be other great uh, other other clay pens, but Grevillea thalamaniana is only associated with these clay pens. Now that report, that Chomky report I was talking about, produced by Emerge, that actually said, oh, you know what? We will we will actually destroy some of the Grevillea thalamaniana populations along the verge, but that's not a problem because there are actually a lot of areas in, 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 in the region over there that are actually in poor shape and we can actually plant them there. Now, I've never heard such a dumb statement because really this Grevillea thalamaniana has had thousands, if not tens of thousands of years to arrive there. And if that species does not occur in those places where they want to plant it and do that as an offset, if that species is not there, it is basically because that environment is not suitable for Grevillea thalamaniana. So you can plant it there, you can plant anything there, but it will not survive there. Because even in Ellison Baird Reserve, and the students who 
did a course with Bill Lonergan and will know that very well. Even in Ellison Baird Reserve, it's only on very, in very specific locations where that extra phosphorus, where that extra calcium and where the continuous supply of water is. If that's not there, that species will not be there. And you can plant it wherever you like, but it only will thrive where the environment is right. What is the time frame going forward? Well, the submissions to the city of Gosnells to object to this 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 report, uh, that time frame has now is now passed, and I, I think now we have to find out what happens next. Uh, the, so the city of Gosnells will have to respond to all the complaints, and there are lots of complaints. I can tell you that from individuals and also from groups and also from UWA because. After all, Ellison Baird Reserve is 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 under threat. So UWA has also strongly written a very strong submission. So it it is not so. So the city of Gosnell will have to respond to that, and whether that will have to be endorsed or not by the EPA, I'm not entirely sure about that. But that is what we will find out, and we definitely want to meet with the EPA and tell them what the Shongi report was actually provided and they should not allow the this 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 development to go ahead. Now, of course, EPA does not make any decisions. They can only provide advice to the Minister for the Environment and the Minister for Planning. So then it would also be time for the Bilia group and others to actually meet with meet with the EPA and the ministers and actually explain what's actually going on and that this development simply must not go on or you will destroy the jewel in the crown of our biodiversity hotspot. So Rachel said, um, I live quite close to this area and I'm curious, are there any volunteer opportunities? I'm also just starting to study botany at UWA and curious if there are any projects that could be joined in on. Well, we have lots of little projects that we have in, in Ellison Baird Reserve and, uh, and she could join a project like that, for example. But when it comes to volunteers, uh, one of the, the issues in Ellison Baird Reserve, like in many other reserves, is of course weeds. Now the weeds on the on the on the fire breaks, they are sprayed by, by UWA, so that's being taken care of. But then the weeds in the in the bushland, <clears throat> like the gladdies, for example, they have to be hand weeded. And every year we bring a group of volunteers of 30, 40 people together and we we dig up the the the, the gladdies for a couple of hours, so I will I will make an announcement on the on the on the Facebook page of the Kwongen Foundation, and I will also announce it on the page of the Wildflower Society and ask for volunteers to actually join us for a couple of hours of weeding work. And I can tell you, where we have been weeding the year before, you can really see a major impact the year after. And it, but of course, with weeds, it's a never-ending story. If you stop doing it then you lost the battle. So you have to keep doing it. And so that's why those volunteers are really uh, very welcome. And so Kirsty wants to know, is the land immediately next to the reserve privately owned or Sydney of Gosnell's land? Uh, some of it is 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 under, under management of DBCA and some of it is actually privately owned. And it's, none of it is actually owned by the city of Gosnells. But that doesn't mean that they have no responsibility for it, of course. So they would not make money out of it by selling it. They would make money out of it by having more rates because these private landowners, they don't pay high rates. But if you have a, a little industry over there, then the rates would really go up. So that's, that's in it for the city of Gosnells. And that's why they are very keen to develop it. And 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 the builder group doesn't say you cannot have any development. The builder group just says have your development, but do that with appropriate buffer zone. So only excise twenty seven percent out of your plans, and then you will be able to look after your wetlands. And for those of you that are interested in watching the first webinar that Hans did about um, phosphorus impoverished soils that is up on our Facebook on the Wildflower Society's page. So uh, we can post the link to that um, tomorrow so it can be easily found, but I would definitely, definitely recommend watching it.
and I left my email address in in the in the talk. So Jackie does not have any questions yet. She says, which sounds like a threat that she will come up with questions <laughs> later. Well, she can always email me, of course. Welcome, Richard, from the Cape Naturalist, Cape Lewin branch. Always nice to meet you. So I, re I regularly have, have guided tours to Ellison Baird Reserve. Uh, I don't want the groups to be too big because then you can't actually interact with all the people. But so, so I, I do that for groups of 20, 30 people. 30 is a bit much, 20 is ideal, but for 10, I'm mostly willing to do that. So if you're interested in, in the tour through Ellison Baird Reserve, feel free to contact me and I'll, and we'll pick a date. So to organize a tour, um, anyone can just email, email you through and try and organize yeah. the date and time? Yeah, yeah. And Richard types a question which I, there must be a typo in there because I'm not entirely sure. I hope we have something to say about air areas also under threat. Uh, maybe it means other areas under threat. I, 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 I was asked to talk specifically about the Greater Brixton Street wetlands, Richard. And so that's why I gave this talk. But of course, there are lots of areas that are under threat. Uh, and quite often from, from oh, in, in the Southwest Capes. Uh, I mean, heaps of areas are under threat uh, and, and mainly from, from, from development, road building, for example, you only have to look at the, the, the Banbury outer ring road where they insist to make that ring road through an area where they should actually steer clear off Ah, yeah. <laughs> For those of you when that... There, when, when there are alternatives, yes. Was, yeah, so for those of you who are also interested, on the Wildflower Society's website, there is a list of all of the submissions that we that we have written and submitted to the different proponents. So if you are interested in reading those and seeing what we are responding against please feel free to visit our website there's a lot on there <laughs> it's a never never ending battle and it is actually astounding if it weren't for organization like the wildflower society and all the volunteers of the of the wildflower society i think the whole area would be on the, on the concrete because i mean if a city of gosnells can come with a plan like that and and basically ignore that precious environment. It's not the, just the city of Gosnells, but but it's other cities that like to 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 widen the road, for example, and ignore all the threatened species that occur along the road, and 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 push development driven by greed rather than driven by the desire to actually look after the precious environment and act as as custodians of the environment. I mean, I think that is our moral obligations to be custodians of our, our environment. And if it weren't for organizations like the Wildflower Society, we would be even worse off than we already are. But even so, there are still plenty of threats. Definitely agree with that. I think we are running out running out of questions. I think so. Oh wait. Possibly one more. If we are rewilding our gardens nearby, would it be recommended species to plant to aid conservation in our gardens nearby? Obviously, those that need continuous water wouldn't work. <laughs> 
but is there a list of species recommended for conservation? Um, I would basically go for the local species, depending a little bit on, on what you want to achieve. I mean, we have a native garden, and if you want to see that, just Google my name and Gardening Australia, and you can actually have a look for six minutes uh, and see Costa in, in visiting our garden. And he actually came up with the term biodiversity city, because we've got biodiverse city rather than biodiversity city, because he, we started looking at our verge and then went to the back garden. So he, he talked about a biodiverse city. So we, we, we plant things that are local to Southwest Australia. Most of them are local to Southwest Australia, but I can also tell you when you want to attract the birds, they don't actually mind if there is the odd eucalyptus from South Australia. If it, if it feeds them, then you're actually quite happy with it. But, and, and, and our garden actually has become a magnet for native bees. Uh, Kit Prendergast did actually a project in our garden and it actually turns out our garden is a hotspot for native bees, and then she found she found more native bees in our garden than any of the other gardens that she she actually studied in her in her project. So, I would I would go for the ones that 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 are native to your area, that suit the soil. Don't try to change the soil, but try to pick plants that actually can cope with your soil, and go for plants that don't demand a lot of water. And there are some excellent native plants nurseries and somebody is just putting up a list over here. I, I, I do go to a number of them. A Pace is one of them, but he also go regularly to Nancy Skate's nursery. And I, I understand Nancy Skate is giving one of the next webinars here. Yes, Nancy is doing our October webinar. So all those that are interested, which I'm sure is most people, they will be doing it about um, conservation of threatened and rare flora, I believe is the title. So that'll be released uh, within the next few weeks. And we should be also be having another webinar uh, in about two weeks at the end of September, all, all going well. So uh, please keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, that should be up around at the start of next week. Um, and if not, then yes, please come along to the October webinar with Nancy. So Michelle said she's interested in a tour of the area. Uh, and you found it difficult to find a clear path. Well, you will find it very difficult to find a clear path because the area is actually fenced off. But I happen to have a key and I'm very happy to take you through and, and arrange a guided tour. If you have a group of 10, 20 people, then I'm very happy to uh, to arrange a tour. So get in touch with me and 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 we'll find a, a suitable time. We can upload all of this information as well on the Society's website tomorrow. So if you're worried about forgetting anything, then don't worry. <laughs> we'll upload it all, yeah. all tomorrow. And um, yeah, hands you'll probably get a lot of emails <laughs> because be, I think a lot of people are going to want tours. So just before we wrap things up as well, there is a survey just at the end of the webinar. If anyone who has the time would, wouldn't would mind filling it in, that would be very, very helpful for the Wildflower Society as any feedback is very, very valued and appreciated. Um, if anyone has any more questions, please, please send them through and we'll upload the webinar and all of this information uh, should be tomorrow and if not tomorrow then it'll be Monday next week so don't worry if you've forgotten anything <laughs> we'll upload it all for everyone to look at again um, I think that is all the questions so I would just like to thank you Hans for coming along again for the second time your presentations are very very good to watch we're very thankful that you've come on again so thank you so much for that my pleasure Perfect. Okay. Thanks everyone again for attending and we hope to see you at our next one. Keep an eye out on the Facebook page and please fill out the webinar if you have time. Thank you. See ya. Bye-bye.